you know, you know. Um, we take a joke out here. School resource officer supervisor for this one, I'm a service officer. Um, my job can tell is, is to make sure that <clears throat> all schools have SROs in them working on a daily basis, um, overseas security, things like that for the school. So that's what I do since I've been appointed to this um, position. And um, it's been a reward and one to get a first day. Because, you know, um, if you know it, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in our community as far as the violence and it's carrying over into our schools. And so it's a tough task, but we are looking for community support in this task. It's not an easy one. It's very difficult. Um, I guess we'll get the light to put on the shirt. I guess we'll get to talk about gangs and I guess we'll get to some issues that you may or may not have. Um, with what's going on in the past couple of weeks with a lot of the shootings, uh, homicides, and things of that nature. Um, you have a situation where we got young men running wild. And what they're doing is pretty much instilling fear and intimidation in our communities as well as our schools. Not all of them, but you just have a select few. That's what they're doing. That's the main goal because for some reason they don't think that that life matters. And I, and I hate to say it because when I talk to young men, they'll tell you that, you know, it's not guaranteed to because they have nothing to look forward to. And I tell them it's not true. I don't know if it's begging from home, but law enforcement that we have is, you know, they don't trust us because they think we're out to get them, which is not true. Not yet, so we kind of sure talk to you. I mean, everybody has their bad apples, and it is what it is. And we try to work with what we have. But for the most part, that's their thing. And when you sit there, you try to talk to these young men, and you understand some come from broken homes. Um, some come from where parents are just working, and they are allowed to run in the streets with their friends. So what do you do? It's one of the things that you try to put stuff in place for them. The first thing they'll tell you is that we do more. We do a lot of stuff because we do And and I tell them you can't be bored because we have a lot of opportunities. We have a lot of programs out here for you to just take advantage. It's just that the force is so strong from the streets to the point that a lot of parents can't control it. And I know this one first hand because we get those calls. I had to go call them when we got a new juveniles. We got to go and sit down and talk to them. The parents are frustrated because the streets have more love for them than the parents. For some strange reason, they feel so they don't have to listen to their parents. And it's just like sometimes it feels like you're trying to catch call it, but, but when you reach just that one, you know, it makes a difference. And what is happening in our community is that we have a few that are informed to others to do. Um, without giving anything away, um, we arrested four last week from the ages of 14 to 25. And these guys are now told about automatic weapons. Because whether you're going that or going online, and they figure out how to switch these guns from semi automatic to automatic with simply a selective switch, which is illegal. So we're trying to get these guns off the street to the best of our ability, but it seems like it's a never ending task. But once we take guns off the streets, it seems like more of the aircraft on the street. And this is the thing that you must have wants to ask you. Where are they getting these guns from? They get it from probably breaking in houses, breaking in cars, and taking the guns. And I hate to say it, and they're being sold on the black market. You look at the number of guns that we've confiscated in the last couple of weeks, 
um, two assault rifles, 40 dollars, 30 round clips, 50 round clips. And you know, they take these guns and don't care who they're shooting at. They're shooting at certain individuals, but they're not taking into consideration the fact that rest in place in that round. And we have a lot of innocent people getting shot by these rounds, being killed. You know, it's just that if we can reach the parents somehow and, and explain to them, educate them on the games, because the thing is really, they have a hierarchy, they have a command that they go by, that they got to adhere to, and they tell these young men and women to go out and commit these heinous crimes, shoot them, drive them. Because sometimes, you know, you have the females driving these young men around. And that's what they do. They have to prove every day. Every day they have to prove these young people to get out there and do these things. It's like, you know, just when you think that you have a hand on it, then you turn around and it's like something else is occurring. And when we try to talk to parents, they be in denial. My child's not part of the game. I get it. Nobody wants to raise their child as being part of the game. It's out here creating this chaos in our, in our communities, in our schools. So what do you do? Until it's too late. When they got to sit there, we got to give them that notice. You know, that's the difficult part about what is happening now, is that we have to deliver those notices to the parents. For something that simply that they could have taken time out to get a handle on it, Let's be honest, when we grew up, our parents knew where we were every second, every hour of the day. Who we were with and where we were going, the whole time. That's not the case anymore. That's not the case. I wish I knew an answer or solution other than community to come together and just put a stop to it. Just say enough is enough. Law enforcement community, we all need to band together. It's not, like the mayor said, it's everybody's issue because it's affecting community all around this country. Not just here in Prestonville, it's affecting it everywhere. Because we are sitting here having to investigate shootings of young people. And it's amazing when you sit there, you're talking about 12 and 14 year olds getting shot. 12 and 14 year olds carrying guns to school. How do they get them? Where do they get them from? That's what we would like to know. And I know you as citizens, you have a lot of questions. You're like, what is going on? We don't know. And I know that from, from my 30, almost 30 years of being in law enforcement, this is that time of year where activity is, is more prevalent now in, in, that, in that community because it's like everybody is trying to make a name for themselves within these organizations. And true form, we have feuds now that are starting back with what we call the OG or the old gangsters, which they are now we know in old feuds, and now they are having issues with one another, along with the younger crowd. Um, I just went to a um, one-day gang conference in Salemburg probably about three weeks ago, and the one thing that the officer told us, and which I kind of knew, is that the hybrid gangs are the most dangerous gangs that there are because these are the group of individuals from the age of 12 to 20 who are branching off from the traditional gang set and they're trying to start their own set, which is what they're doing now. They are out here doing most of the shooting, mostly the rock, breaking houses, because their thing is they're looking for guns. It's called a high, these are hybrid gangs. They're branching off. And that's what we're seeing now more than ever, especially within our schools. You know, last couple of days we've been looking at the news, you see fights breaking out. You know, that's what they're doing. Everybody is jockeying out the territory, and that's what they're doing. These hybrid games are jockeying for territory because now they're trying to establish themselves. That's where we are now. And it's trickling down to our middle schools and down to elementary schools, believe it or not. Because, you know, like I said, if you ever have an opportunity to go to your school in Richmond County, just stop by and visit. And you will see some of the things that I'm talking about. And it's like, what is going on? 
The educators are having so much problems to the point where they can't teach because they got to be disciplined. They're disciplining these kids at a long rate versus trying to educate them. And it's, and it's boggles the mind to actually see that, that they're there to educate our children and they can't do it because they got to be still disciplined. And that's where we are now. What's the solution? My thing is, we just have to band together as a community and come together and say enough is enough. And I think if we ever decide to do that, we just may have a chance to turn this thing around. We got to put our differences aside, regardless of who feel about what, and just come together and work. And if we do that, maybe we'll strike some type of tension and get these young men and women back on the right track. But I understand everything starts at home. We're on the outside, but everything starts at home. But when home life is difficult, as it is for most of these young men and women all, then it's time for adults on the outside, such as myself, such as you, such as everybody here, to step in the game up and make a difference in everybody's lives. You know, we need more mentoring programs. I'll tell you, that's what we need. We need these guys that have been through the system, excuse me, that are willing to come back and educate these young men and women about what it's like to be caught up in the system. Because once you get caught up in the system, it's so hard to get out. I, I'm just a firm believer in that. I mean, sometimes I step on behind my dad's all the time because I really don't get it. But the thing of it is, I sometimes get frustrated because am I fighting a losing battle? And sometimes I don't because I reach that one to change that makes me push a little bit harder. So I ask the last closing, let's come together and make this thing. Let's not be about it. Let's be about it. Let's not talk about it. Let's make it happen. Let's put it in action. Thank you. Any questions for me? Uh, let's you mentioned something about um, mentors. I have the done here. Uh, you have a thing to add to that, Mr. Down. You got a very successful board mentoring program. We do. I don't know if I'd call it successful in the sense that uh, we don't honestly do all the support that we could actually use. Um, but there's some things that what you said struck my attention because I was thinking about the future before I got here. Uh, you kept referring to parenting and things going on at home. And this morning I wrote this statement about parenting and thought about it as coming to this meeting. And so we need to stop cramping for, for, for parents. We need to stop doing that for them. And we need to start teaching parents how to parent. So we need to flip the switch on what we're doing to, to make a difference. And this is a long-term process. That's what's really wrong. You know, when we get in these situations, we think for some reason or another, we can come to a meeting like this and we can solve the problem and we can go home and be happy. It's not true. Truth of the matter is, it's going to take years and years of grinding and things of that nature to change, to reverse the situation of that. It's just like a guy like me who's got too much weight. I'm in a gym and I have to stay in the gym and I want to be in the gym because it's going to take time to lose the weight. The same is true with what's going on with these young men in this, this community. We have got to get to the place that we make parents stand up to their responsibility. It doesn't make a difference about it being a 15 year old that has a baby or as it does a 40 year old. We got to let that parent take care of it because that's the person that this kid is going to respect the most. <clears throat> so we got to train that parent to do the right thing. Uh, it's nice for them to come to the mentoring program. I thought so. I've been doing it for 13 right. years. But the truth of the matter is, I work better with the kids whose parent is also involved, mm -hmm. who respects the fact that the program. And that's what we need to get to. We need to get parents to get involved and take care of their responsibility. We don't have a, a program or something, a lot of programs that fill that particular thing, but that's where we need to be putting the gas in the tank. We need to get parents doing what they need to be doing, and we can do it. We can do it with the churches in, in this community. We can do it with people who are already established the mentoring programs and things of that nature. We can we can do that. I mean, 
with my program, there's not a church that stands up and you know that that actually comes to the program. I'd like to see at least one program, one one program, one one person from one church, along with one kid from that church to come to the program. You know, as a, as a mentor to be there to to be a, a real tutor to that kid. To that kid. I like to see churches be able to tell people, you know, but they because these these people that have these babies, their parents, they're somebody that's connected with church. They need to be these churches need to say to them, well, look, you are going to have to take care of this responsibility. If these people who have the babies allow the allow the grandma to take care of them, they're going to continue to drop them off at grandma's house until grandma says my house is too crowded. You know, it's, 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 it's funny, but it's, it's, it's the truth. That's, that's what goes on. But if you make them be responsible, and I'm saying, you know, tell them, well, look, this is your baby, you take care of it. Yes, you're going to give them some help. But you are also not going to neglect the fact that the responsibility <laughs> is there and help grow them and nurture them in that responsibility. I could go on and on, but I'm going to just stop here. We have about four minutes left in this section. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. You were mentioning um, mentoring programs. <coughs> Do you know of any funding that's, that are available for mentoring programs that we might be able to get materials to, to, to um, pass on to someone that they're interested in starting? There's um, a bunch of materials that um, Young Man Science Murphy, um, he has a mentoring program. <coughs> He goes and gives these grants and keep it, you know, put it out there because he has one himself with young men that he mentors um, during summertime. Um, Applebee's wife was on the board, and um, we don't pay for just to, to Applebee's. We pay to anybody that wants to be a part of the program. Um, it's involved conditioning, um, educational things, um, visiting college campuses, things of that nature. So, um, yeah. Um, he would be the one you probably could talk to because he does a lot of things. Um, and I forgot to mention that. And speaking of the gentleman back there, um, the sheriff always has a program. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know about It's called the Willie Week. That's right. And uh, so I understand the frustration of the parents. It's a program that we, we, we designed not so much to scare the straight program because you can't get scare anybody straight. Let's be honest. This is so much about it. Um, it's about taking young men and women with behavior problems in school, outside of the home, um, take them, spend the day with us. And there's a section that's four out of the block from 7.30 to about 12.30 where the parent has to come. That's the biggest issue that we're facing because we tell them, you cannot come and drop your child off. You as a parent have to come for the first four hours which um, Ishmael County Public Schools, they does a parenting course. They bring in different speakers, um, have different programs that they can probably go to. And we're certainly having problems as far as the kids from the mental aspect, even out to behavior problems. But the problem that we're having is parents do not want to take that one day off. And we had it um, last Friday every month. And it's from ages 10 to 16, which we make modifications for it. Um, and the thing about it, you know, they follow the checklist they, when they come to our program for that one day. Um, and it's very inter interesting. I think that the, that the last part of the day, once we take them through everything else, and we sit down and have that one-on-one -on -one with them, they write letters to their parents saying, some of the things that these young men and women are feeling that go to the touch, um, when they actually sit in there at the end of the program, and they read their letters and they wrote from their heart, some of it is speaking the truth, some of it embarrass the family because the mother because they're speaking from the heart about some of the things that they're feeling, um, some of the things that they open up to the power that they need to about, which um, Jane Silk is one of the officers. We expect to have picked officers that we pick to deal with these kids. We just don't want anybody coming in with these kids um, dealing with them. But it's, it's, it's one of those things that at the end of that day, these kids write that letter. It's very emotional. And like I said, we do follow up with them. And believe it or not, we had 60 applicants. 
out of the 60, I'm saying maybe 35 to 40 were out of town. Hmm. We started opening it up to everybody. We opened up to the citizens first. But we wouldn't get a response they needed to give it, so we decided to open up to anybody that wanted to come to Brady Town. So it's frustrating. I understand what you're saying when it comes to parents not willing to think because we're trying to get to come to this one day program because we don't want to take time off of it. You know, God's good for us. We're going to try. Um, the option is not to give up. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, time is up. If you haven't had a question or comment, we'll move around to after the next presentation. Dr. Shaw? is a licensed clinical mental health therapist, supervisor, and also a certified life coach. Dr. Shaw. to first of all just start talking about what I bring to this context and uh, this discussion that we're having. I was raised on the Edgecombe County side of in Rocky Mount, a uh, lifelong resident there. Also, I retired after 33 years of service as a public school teacher. And my last 10 years were right here in Edgecombe County school system. More importantly, I chose, I came out of the traditional uh, school and chose to work in the alternative school here in Edgecombe County. And the reason I did that was because I have a passion for working with troubled youth. And for some of you, you may remember the alternative school was at the old Robertson um, Elementary School. It was called CEA. That's where I worked. Um, a few years ago and retired out of that setting. While working at uh, Robertson, I was also a mental health therapist. I did that from a part-time uh, standpoint. After retiring, I continued to work in the mental health field and realized that a lot of the behavioral issues that we're seeing with young people uh, it's already been mentioned with, uh, by the lieutenant and some of, uh, of you concerning the parenting issues. But uh, one of the main things that's been discovered with trouble with you, not all, is that there are some mental health issues that could be uh, fueling some of the behaviors that you see. So it's out of these experiences, I just wanted to share with you a few observations, a few things that I've learned, and a few things that are truly fact that we need to take into consideration as we engage in this um, conversation. First of all, when we start thinking about mental health or mental illness, more importantly, the thing I want us to remember is that the human body is made of three components, the body, the soul, and the spirit, okay? The soulish realm is that realm wherein we have our mind, our emotions, and our, our will. So with mental health, what has happened is, or mental illness, excuse me, what has happened is that if we don't take care of all three components, then things get out of whack. When we don't take care of that soulish realm, that could be, not necessarily that it is, but that could be the beginning of mental illness. Now, sometimes mental illnesses occur as a result of environmental situations, or it could be biological. In other words, there could be chemical imbalances that could also be the result of mental health. When it comes to imbalances and us not taking care of ourselves properly, Children have to be taught how to take care of themselves, okay? Even from a young, early age, they have to be taught. Just like we learn how to take care of a physical body, we have to teach children how to take care of their mental and their emotional states. If not, even as a child, things can get out of whack, okay? Uh, children are like sponges, and they will absorb whatever they're told, but more importantly, that saying that we hear actions speaks louder than words. 
they really take on more of what they see and imitate what they see more so than what we say to them. So we have to be very careful of the examples uh, before them. For some parents, and I'm not going to reiterate a whole lot of things because a lot of the points that have already been said by the lieutenant and others concerning parenting, I had it down here. So I won't reiterate those so you know that's a big issue, all right? But with parenting, sometimes in their attempt to give children what they did not have growing up, they forget to give children the good things that they did have when they grew up. And what are some of these good things? Teaching children how to respect themselves and other people. How to be patient, not to be selfish, how to be humble, how to forgive, how to use good decision-making skills and problem-solving skills. I am working with uh, children um, in the school system as well as mental health. They have no talk, they have no critical thinking skills. Those things have to be taught, okay? So that is a, a, could be a parenting issue. Another thing, we have to teach children how to be good leaders and not just followers, because that's a problem that we see also, okay? Now these are a few statistics. There is a relationship between violence and mental health disorders, substance abuse, negative childhood experiences, and environmental factors. If a person has a severe mental illness, they may have other risk factors for violent behavior. So it may not necessarily be just because they have a mental illness that's causing the violence, okay? But it could be. Individuals who have a mental illness that we call a psychosis. These are the people who may have some kind of, some kind of chemical imbalance and they may talk to themselves, they hear voices. That is real. That's, that's a psychotic kind of state. That's real. But everybody out here committing violent crime, not hearing voices, okay? They ain't saying things, okay? But there are, there's a population that uh, does fall into that category. Now, a study was done out of 34,653 people. Watch this. Only about 2.9% of the people with a serious mental illness who committed a violent crime out of that number. Now, there's been a lot of research. However, 10% of, of that population of people with both serious mental illness and watch this, a substance abuse disorder commit crime. So you see, it's not just the mental health uh, disorder. But coupled with other things, and especially substance abuse, that in, that uh, increases the risk of some type of violence, okay? Uh, and when people use substance abuse, because I work with substance uh, abuse uh, clients also, they're self-medicating a bigger problem. That's a way of escape, okay? So we got an issue that's going on here. Now here's some other factors. Anger. Anger management is important and needed, okay? Because people don't know how to control anger. And we see that not just with children, but with adults too. But for a child, believe it or not, divorce, separation, financial problems, victimization of some type of other violence that may have been committed towards them. And especially if drugs are uh, involved. When someone uses drugs, it encourages, they get a level of bravery and courage to do things that they would not normally do. Bullying is a problem. Sometimes violence is committed simply because a bully gets tired, excuse me, a person who's been bullied gets tired of being bullied. So they become the bully so that they can regain power. They just get mad, they get tired, they get fed up, okay? Social media, you know that social media, these TikTok challenges, they're encouraging violence. What does that go back to? Parents need to monitor what these children are watching, okay? Gang activity, as has been stated. Um, now, this is another factor towards mental illness, and I believe in it, I believe it's true, but I don't, I am not a proponent that. It is the primary of the sole cause of violence. The incomplete brain formation. The brain, the prefrontal cortex, does not 
uh, fully develop until age 25. That's the front part of the brain where the decision making, the impulsivity center, all of that's in the front part of the brain. But it doesn't fully develop until age 25. In some court cases, they have even ordered a juvenile where their brains weren't fully developed. Well, I don't buy it in all situations. It's a truth. It is a truth. But that is not the main reason why some of these violent acts are occurring, okay? Now, one thing that is very, very important, intergenerational trauma. Now, when you think of that word generational, look at the first letters of it, G-E-N-E, gene. Intergenerational trauma is called a second form or second, uh, yeah, second form of trauma. It's trauma that's passed down. But notice this, intergenerational is passed down in the genes. So if you've got a parent who has anger issues, it can be transmitted in the genes. If you have a parent that has tendencies toward violence, it can be passed down in the genes. I'm working with adults right now that are suffering from intergenerational trauma, okay? And it can play itself, itself out in different ways. When you have, if you notice patterns of families, and they have certain patterns, behavioral issues that seem like to be a part of that family, it could possibly be intergenerational, okay? So that is another thing that we have to take into consideration. So some uh, possible treatment options. We talked about parenting, so I won't go there. Childhood emotional neglect is, what is, is real. Childhood emotional neglect is we're giving these children all these sneakers, all these iPads, and all this other stuff, but we're not uh, providing the emotional support that they need. They go out and they find it some other ways. Now, they may go out and do crazy things, or they may become withdrawn, be, uh, develop low self-esteem, a whole lot of things can develop, develop from that, okay? Um, we talk about mentoring. Family therapy, in some instances, is needed. Notice I didn't just say individual therapy for the child. Family therapy, because in my job, I find that parents want you to wave a magic wand and fix that child, and don't want to take credit for what they could possibly have contributed to that child's behavior. Some cases, medication is needed. I am not a proponent for just advocating medicine across the board for any and everything, but some of these mental illnesses, they need medicine. If it is a psychotic kind of situation, no question about it, they need their medication, okay? Um, conflict resolution training uh, is also something that's needed. Now, last thing, some local resources. You have mental health agencies, throughout the community, Edgecombe, Nash, and some other uh, surrounding communities. But if you don't know um, a particular agency, the regional uh, governing, mental health governing agency is East Point. You can call the Rocky Mountain office and they can tell you all of the mental health agencies within our regions. Now, another thing that a lot of parents don't want to do because they don't want their baby to be taken away, some of these kids need to be out of seat involuntarily commit, hmm. go to the magistrate's office. If they become a danger to themselves and other people, IBC is needed where they can become hospitalized. Now, separation, Tar Heel Challenge is another uh, organization that I uh, know of uh, young people that I've gone to, kind of like a military style organization, but I have seen children come back well behaved, learn self-discipline, get the high school diploma, and Tar Heel Challenge um, works with 16 to 18 year olds who are dropouts. Now, last thing, in talking with parents, when those children get so out of hand and they cannot handle them, and recommendations, whether it's from the probation office or whomever, they need to be sent away, you hear parents say, I just don't want to send my baby away. But your baby is terrorizing you hmm. and the neighborhood. So hmm. my final question is, would you prefer to send your baby away to possibly learn self-discipline, respect, a trade, 
a high school diploma, and then come back to you, focus with a productive life plan, or have them taken away, put in jail for life by law enforcement or by worse, can be relevant. Hmm. Come on now.
counselor of the Rocky Mountain, found a group. Meet a family in life center. And while you come in, uh, is there any statistics out there that tell us what percent of the incarcerated suffer from mental illness? No. Or so, I'm sorry, from there. Either Lieutenant Cofield or what? you. Is there any statistics that tell us the percentage of the incarcerated who suffer from mental illness? Well, I don't, I don't think it's um, all that I can say is that they come to jail every day. <clears throat> um, for one thing or another, um, like I said, you know, they, they're just dumped out on the streets and left to the point where we have to deal with it uh, because nobody wants to take the time out with them. But um, we do have um, psychiatrists that come to our jail to actually talk to them and try to get them some help while they're in our facility. And hopefully, and that carries on to the week. So, yeah, it's, the number is the number that I can't give you. Right? Right. You get them every day. Okay. Where are we going? Thanks for the time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council, City Manager. Thank you, City of Princefield. Thank you, presenters. Um, I'm going to bring you greetings from. Uh, our fair city, Rocky Mount, uh, and uh, Kalia, uh, where I have the privilege to serve as some great people. I'm going to talk about some community grassroots strategy process that uh, we uh, try to apply as a city council with Rocky Mount. Also, we use the same principles and process uh, as we do things at Kalia, because the basis of it is all of us are working with the same thing, right? What is challenging you is challenging us. All of us are being challenged a lot. And so one of the basic process that we uh, work with uh, in our area of Rocky Mountain community-based strategy is, is, is how do we make sure that what we are doing is community-led and not institutional-led? And you hear me talk about it a lot. Uh, community led, institutional supported. So we in the city try to make sure that we are literally empowering and following the lead of our community and our citizens. And so and we are making sure that we are building policies and procedures around how do we really, because there are people in our community that are not here tonight. Right? And so the only way they can hear this is that we gonna have to, those of us here got to take it back to them and build a grassroots strategy because they're the one that's gonna make the change. One of the things, some of the things we do is that we have uh, community organizations uh, and we work with those community organizations. Brother Hendon, Faith Face, and Brittany Pastor, it's good to see you here. Uh, we work with our faith-based process, right? And we, we try to make sure that we're collaborating with our community 501c3s, our community groups, our faith-based, and our businesses in our community. And, and so it's, it's, we, we have our city council meet, we have these meetings, but we have strategy meetings at a community level. <clears throat> So, so every month uh, we are meeting uh, with at least 14 to 20 community groups. That we want all of us to be on the same page, right? And so these services that we're talking about, you know, how do we get them managed by the community? And how do we at the city council look at how do we find resources to try to help move these processes. One of the things that we uh, have worked real hard on in the city of Rocky Mount is that we're looking at, we've looked at that uh, our communities don't own themselves. We have a high rate of rental property. We have a high rate of predators that have made a living off from these communities that they don't stay in the community, right? 
And so we're looking at, one of the process we looked at is community wealth building. Is, is some communities have been in existence a long time, but how many know you need some wealth to do some things? Right. Right? So, so, so we want to see how can we build collective wealth in our communities. And so one thing we did, we collaborate our communities to begin to see how our communities begin to lead home ownership in a collaborative wealth building process. And so we, we're rolling that program out. Other, a lot of different programs, we've got one program with faith bases. Uh, our faith-based community is working on how we make sure that our citizens stay warm during the winter and cool during the summer. How does that important? We're working on how we make sure that our youth is, is being taken care of on a street-based process. What does it really need to, to make sure that we're taking care of our youth? And so when we go to these community-based organizations, we're not trying to go and tell them what they need to do. Well, as a matter of fact, we are working for them. So we're asking them how can, can everybody want to live in a safe community, hmm. right? You know, if I want to go jogging at 3 o'clock in the morning, I want to go do it. And I want to be chased. Hmm. <laughs> it's a different than jogging and chasing. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, the best process we've been doing, and and work with our young people, five year old students is smart. Never underestimate the genius of young people. They can literally tell you. And so, uh, a process uh, came behind here that he's in the Clark Brent Street area. Uh, they have two homes that they're working on. Uh, that they're going to turn these homes into homeowners uh, in the next two to three to four years. Their goal is to turn their whole community into home ownership, right? That empowered the community. Now you've got community people out cleaning the yard. It's their home. The city is supporting them on it. Our police department is supporting them on it. And so, and so our faith base is important on our churches. And so we, we, we believe that community based strategies and we believe in institution support. A lot of times institutions come in and try to tell the community what they need to do. Not come in and say, how can I help you do what you want to do? And so we're, we're pushing a strong process of how do we do that. And, and we're trying to stop gentrification. How many of people looking at us? Right? People look at how do we make more money off poor people. But we're not poor. Hmm. We've just been disadvantaged a little bit, but we're not poor. Hmm. All, right, all right? Okay. And, and we agree that we're going to stop fighting each other. Right? We're gonna put our differences aside and we're gonna we're gonna help each other because while we're fighting each other, maybe guess what? The predator come in and take advantage of both of us. Hmm. And so and so very simple. Uh, so our city council meetings are not held on Monday night. They're held in the community. We just express it on Monday night. And so and so we, we really want our community to know that what they think, what they say, and who they are is valuable. And that we hear, right? And so, and so we, we, our policy there is community-based strategy, community-owned, community-led, institutional support. And so that's, that's and there's a lot more programs that we run We've seen a reduction in our crime, and we've seen more collaboration on a grassroots level, right? And so, and so we're working with each other. If they want a community garden, maybe guess what? Then we make sure they have it, right? If they want that home uh, cleaned up, maybe guess what? We make sure that they have it. 
They want trucks not parked in their community. Maybe guess what? We made sure to have it. And so we are here to serve them, support them, and not blame them. So that's community based strategy. Questions, comments, concerns? Mm -hmm. So in Arizona, I think it's Arizona, they have a statute that says that if community are the ones to try to change the behavior and the dynamic, partnering with the community partnering mm -hmm. with the elected officials of yes. the power that be. We won't have to rely so much on the police to do anything but to maintain. Yes, it's, it's maintenance. You know, it's not that we got any institution. No institution have to come have to manage the community if they support the community. Right? And so it's community owned, community managed, institutional support. And so and our police department, our chief of police, chief council, council uh, our sheriff, uh, they work together and strategizing and coming to the meetings and literally listening to our, our citizens. The flip side of it is we sit out here and the citizens sit out there telling us what they we go and try to make it happen. And you don't have to make a whole lot happen. If you just make one thing happen, they happen. Right? I mean, you just make one thing happen that it won't make happen. I mean, we turned one home, one home that was dilapidated and been messed up for a long time. That one home, you know, we go. Take our human resource personnel. We take our uh, 
uh, our people from different departments come out and our chief of police come out and we sit with the community. We do, we do this thing called community walkthroughs where all of our departments that our city managers deem necessary, we go out in the community and we walk door to door to door to door. And we say to the city workers, if there's, a, if there's an area in the community that you don't want to stay in and you, you feel that you can't stay in, if you're not working to change that area of the community, you need to give up the job. Because your paycheck is coming from those people that stay in those areas. And we value every citizen in Rocky Mount, whether they're living on the street or wherever they are, if you're in that city around, we value you. And we listen to you. And so we're here to serve you. You're not here to serve us. And, and that mentality and our faith, faith, let me get my money. <laughs> Mary, this thing, take your money. <laughs> so, yeah, make you take your own money before I can be able to cheat. <laughs> but but it's seriously, that's, that's the reason we, we're here to listen, to work together. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate you. And I do have to go back to Rocky Mountain. We've got a phone deep going on this evening, all right? Thank you so much. And anything that we can do, I'll speak for our council, our city, uh, council, Jerome, anytime you want to come to those meetings, I'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mark, well, oh, I say so much time. <laughs> uh, First of all, I want to thank the Honorable Mayor, the Council members, but most importantly, the citizens that came out today. Um, I'm very emotional right now because even though I don't reside here, I'm home. I'm emotional for two reasons. One is the concerns of what's going on here. And the other is we not being Most of you know me. You know my passion, love, and desire for people in general, primarily black people, and primary, primary people from my home. On the board, it said these will build a strong castle and tell both the men. I hope to share with you today something, some ideas, some solutions that can help us. I emphasize us because this is my home. Because that bridge is not a divide. If that bridge wasn't there, then Area. So I'm speaking to not only Princeville, but I'm speaking to all of Ace County Council. I'm glad to see the mayor of Tarver, he came. I think the mayor of, of Pine Top is here. Is any other mayor here? Any other council member from any other municipality here? No, Mayor Pro Kim. Pro Kim of Pine Top. Pine Top, thank you for y'all for coming. Thank you for coming. I, 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 at the next meeting, or the private meetings, or the rolling meetings, let's get the law enforcement 
from all the pigs called cattle. A representative of something. Okay. Let's get this going. Because I done shook off what I had. A little bit. Because I had texted my wife and I told her I wish she was here. And she just texted me back and said, The man called. <laughs> Watch your voice pitch. Because those of y'all know me, I can get a little And But the last thing she said was, Apply the pressure. So I'm just going to share with y'all some. I'm just going to, I want to be solution driven, focus driven. Now, before I even say that, look, I answer a call that your illustrious mayor went to social media on. From that, God put in place for me to be coming to North Carolina at this moment. He did not reach out to me. I reached out to him. I hit him with his email and said, can I do anything? I would be glad to speak with you to give you some suggestions. Then God did what he did. He said, no, I'm here to North Carolina because you got to handle some personal business. But you're going to go and handle some family business too. Because we are family. Okay. So, let's get to it real quick. The most honorable minister, Lord Farrakhan, state this quote here. Violence grows out of hopelessness and despair. And we are in that moment of hopelessness and despair. And our results that we are getting is becoming violent. Now, everybody's going to do their part. Lieutenant Kofi, I grew up with him. He's on this part. He has seen the Bible firsthand. He has seen things that he can't get erased out of his mind. Law enforcement is going to do their part. But what's bigger than law enforcement is the community. We all know that saying that it takes a village to raise a child. Y'all. We are, a, we are at a state where there is no children. We are at a point where we have to reestablish or rebuild the village. Until we can rebuild and reestablish the village, we can't do anything for the child. That's what we have to do. So part of my solution that I'm going to share with you today. But before I share the solution, I'm going to share with y'all some of the things. Because some may say, why are he here? He don't live here. My mama is the love of my life. My mama still lives. I don't think it's going to count. Forever. Because that right there. So I'm here because of her and because of you all and our children. Okay? Now, I want y'all to walk with me. I'm going to share some things, but y'all want you to walk with me. Flag Football League. East Harbor, Franksville, Long Pine Lakeside. GD class. Welding class. Summer camp, after school suspension, no, in school suspension and out of school, pro, after school program. Mentoring program. Y'all. I want to share with you that it do not take a lot of money. We get caught up at looking at the financial means of things and the notoriety of who is going to take the credit. That's what we get lost in. And we lose 
the moment in time to capture that child. And, I'm a, and I say that because I've seen it. I walked it. Me and less than two or three people. All the things that I shared with you just a second ago. Me and one, two, three, no more than four people. We started the largest Cub Scout in Edgecombe County, in the history of Edgecombe. They told us we had the largest Cub Scout in the Boy Scout of America from North Carolina. I didn't go looking for money. I did it right out of my home church of St. Paul. All of the leadership at the time of Reverend Everett Keith. We started with the help of my cohort back here, Don Parker, DP, a trade and GD class. Only thing we did was went to the community college, talked with the vice president, and he said, okay, you get me 10, I mean, yeah. 10 people to sign up for. We went to his office that day. That evening, Don hit the street of East Harbor and signed up over almost 30 people. Because he went to them. He went to them. We can't stay in this square. He went to them. We went. They said we can't do it unless you give us at least 10 people. Michael Jordan was vice president at the time. Oh, we said they ain't going to be no problem. Then we went to Reverend Terry to get the Oakland house. Get the Oakland house. He said, okay, no problem. The car, then we, we had to find the instructor. The car said, you find the instructor, we would pay the instructor. That's when we got our third cohort. The Honorable Tyrone Knight. Y'all, that didn't cost us a dime. The Cub Scout didn't cost us but a few dollars. But even with the Cub Scout, we met, had about 60 young boys, Cub Scout, not Boy Scouts. We called them early. I went, and when I said Edgecombe County, take a, take a look at this, because this is stuff that y'all don't understand. Or either you don't want to understand, or you can't understand. We went to London night because the enrollment was so high. This is Edgecombe County. Twice a week, London night you us be with her band, two of her bands, twice a week. We picked up little boys. Cub Scout now. We call them Love. Anita, Mildred, Pine Top, Leggett, Lawrence, Tarboro, Southern Terrace. Don't mind listen. I drove one van and went that way. My blood brother, he drove another van and went that way. Twice a week. Twice a week. We did that. Again, the community came together, those who wanted to help. Linda didn't tell us we had to put gas in the van. And we're using not only for that, we use for a lot of other stuff for them cups down. And it didn't take up a few dollars to give them snacks. Because Cub Scout has his own agenda that you can go by. Just that simple. Now the other thing was, let's get to the let's get to the GED part. Let's get to that in the trade part. We got a big college over there still sitting on the. I think it's still on the. We all you got organizations in here. You got the resources in here. You got the individuals, and you got groups. I have always been taught to do the work and the money will come. 
That's what fire plan suggests. Do the work, and the money will come. I did the work. I won't look for the money, but whatever money was needed, we got the money. We got the money. Now, the Factory Road Project out of my Godfather of Reverend John Church. We had the largest summer camp group. We had the largest summer camp group in all the years come down. We ran it five days a week, not three days or four days. Five days a week. Darwin was the program director. We ended up rolling it into when the school started, we ended up rolling into the after school program. Ben and Reverend Joy came to me and said, Look, man, they have a suspension problem. See, I don't know any organization since the one that we did with out of school suspension. I don't know anybody that's touching out of school suspension anymore. Why? I leave that on the community. I had to sit down and talk with Reverend Jonas Deacon Boy because I'm a Muslim. He, he wanted me, but I had to go through that just to do, just to try to save lives. But I went through it because I saw the bigger picture. I saw the bigger picture. So we rolled into the out-of-school suspension program. Y'all, this was five days a week. Edgecombe County School System gave us their children that was in school, out of school suspension. We did. And they went down to the chapel. We used their van to pick them up in the morning just like they were going to school. And the parents of the teacher of we got the child's work. And they came down and they did the work at the church. But the key part of this, we didn't have to get a high Degree instructor. We interviewed a sister that had been a teacher's assistant. And we gave her a small stipend. And she did that the whole school year. Y'all, this don't take a lot of work. But you keep looking at money and think that money is going to solve the problem. It helps. Don't get me wrong. But money ain't gonna solve the problem. Your blood, your sweat, and your tears is what's gonna solve the problem. That's what's gonna solve the problem. Now, speed it up. Prince Hill got this lovely building. They got a lovely building over there. We got several nice churches in the community. If you got an organization, I want to start one. Ask them for space. To hold meetings for whatever you are trying to accomplish. Whatever you're trying to accomplish. Now, I don't side on this dice before. I have been a politician, so I know what how this operates. I know how funding operates. I've been on the lives like this. I know things are regulated. Some things can't be done and some can't. I ain't waste my time. I worked. We worked. And we got the funds. From, it may not have been from a local municipality. It may have been from a friend. Or even people pulling their resources. Let me hit that point. Let me hit that point. Resources. Everybody wants to know where the money is. You got an organization, or even if you don't, let's say five friends get together and say we want to start an organization or we want to do something continuously. Five friends commit to ten dollars a month. Ten dollars a month, how much is that? Five times ten. What is that? Fifty dollars? Yeah. But just imagine five friends commit to a hundred dollars a month. How much is that? $500, eh? 
But say 10 friends commit to $100 a month. 10 friends commit to it. Now, they ain't got to be active in what you're doing. Just find you 10 friends that can commit $100. We got Netflix at $12, $15. You go to Starbucks or eat out. You do all those other things. You buy the latest fashion. But $100 a month. Find you 10 friends. You got $1,000 to do what you want to do. And as you continue to do what you do, you're going to grow your organization. Then other entities are going to see your track record and they're going to give you what you asked for, even almost what you asked for. We have it. This stuff right here. A meet like this. Ain't nothing wrong with somebody facilitating mental health meetings every month. Uh, every week. There's nothing wrong with facilitating financial literacy means every month. There's nothing wrong with having GED class here either across the street or either at somebody's church. Ain't nothing wrong with that. What is that costing us? Now, I'm going to put some people on the spot now. Tate, I'm glad you're here. Glad you these here. But the ones that are not here, the same stuff, y'all. Because what wherever the crime is coming from, what? Some of the killers, the killers in Princeville, but the killers may have been from another, not from Princeville. And you're telling me that they are here, concerned? Because that same person potentially maybe, if they don't get caught, they may go ahead and do something all that y'all. That's why they should be here. I'm, I, I, I am proud of what Princeville is doing right now. The movement they got going on, the development they got going on, the economic development that they got going on. Pull your resources and get, get involved in the economic development of Princeville. Pull your resources. There's some properties, some lots, some problems, some houses that Maybe five or ten of y'all can get together and put some money together and probably can get that spot. Even then you but a lot. You can still use that lot for some of your things, the things you want to do. One of them remind me again with Brother Naim. Amen. We formed that after the Million Man launch. They ain't calling the money. We did events all around Edgewood County. Caring and sharing, giving money to families from people who have who have lost people and all that type of stuff. But y'all, I'm here because I have walked the walk. So I can talk the talk. There's a lot of stories I can tell you. But I'm here to offer solution for the town of Princeville and all of Edgecombe County. Because what I said at the beginning, my mom lived over there. And East Carver. Now, y'all heard that, right? I said East Talker. It's two Talkers. It's East Talker, and then there's Talker. Okay? And we're okay with that. Okay? We're okay with that. But we want our best. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Okay. We're going to wrap up. Yeah. We got some rest of other people down the floor. Yes, sir. Any questions? I have a good question. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Concern about sustaining our program. Um, a lot of the programs that have been somewhat uh, developed over the years, um, you know, as I've been growing up, I've been hearing about a lot of programs, but, you know, where's the sustainment in these programs? Like, as a new and a young uh, organization, we're ever focused on sustaining our program until 20, 30 years from now, our kids are not going through the same things that, you know, the teenagers. So how, how can we sustain our program and uh, how can we get support to really sustain our program? How you sustain your program is, is, is going to the community. Those same business owners that you stay in your lane with, those same churches and religious organizations that you give the time and offerings to, your local municipality, yeah. But your easy, the easiest way for you to get some 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 money, because we say sustainability, but I think I know that you're saying funding. 
Okay, so so I, let's deal with the funding part. Basically, you can you do the work, go to those individuals, those organizations, those business owners, and seek funding for them. Tell them what you were trying to achieve. That's all. And, and, the, and one of the things I, was, I used to do, and somebody gave me twenty dollars because I've been told I'm trying to do this deal. They gonna see me again next week. But somebody gave me a hundred dollars and pour something. They may not see me for maybe a month or so. Okay. Now. Let's 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 see them after this meeting. Yes. Yeah. 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 Any anybody who wants to speak with me, anybody who wants to speak with me, I'm glad to see Pastor Big Show hand out there. Uh, I, I, I'm glad to see that he came uh, because he's ready. He's called her. Okay. okay. But a lot of these pastors, y'all, call on them.
for years and years and years. Me and Brother Muhammad, uh, Donald Parker, we worked these streets and we did things that the other people seemed impossible, but we knew that we could uh, do them. So I make that commitment to you. See me, and we're going to get a hold on this uh, vow, on this trauma, and this stress that's destroying our community. We can't let that happen. We had too great of an investment in our community to let it die. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Jeremy Powers? I didn't think he had to say it, buddy. I'll go to Diggin. Thank you, Mr. Alcorn, for coming. Um, and I definitely want to thank you for your again and your show. So, uh, it did see your commitment over time to our community, and we appreciate you. Um, and to the manager here, I'm um, looking forward to, to talking with you and working with you as well. So, I know we can um, have some conversations um, and the things that you all are looking to do over there. But I'm really ready to talk to my community. Uh, my family's been in this community for over 100 years. Uh, I'm excited. My mommy, I feel the same. That was just a couple years ago. Uh, but I believe that my life is divinely ordered, and God brought me back here. And so I'm back here for a reason. I'm back here with a purpose, and I'm going to live out my mission. I'm going to live out my purpose. Uh, that I'm divinely ordered and called to do. Um, and so, for the sake of time, I'll get right into it. Um, I think that uh, this is a complex. I think that this is a complex issue. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think that this is a complex issue that would take time and uh, an intentional and strategic collaboration to ensure long lasting change. Um, I'd like to make a point, I'd like to point out uh, a lot of the things that I've said are going to be very uh, similar to what you've already heard, but I've said anyway just to, to drop the point home. It's an alert uh, in Asheboro, North Carolina, and a child was left in the alert. I'd like to make a point uh, that out of the recent shootings, although the recent shootings are very tragic and painful to see, However, it's not a majority of our youth. As we support prison reform initiatives um, and programming within our prison system, by supporting the families of the bereaved, um, over, the, the bereaved families as well from suffering and overcoming their suffering and pain, we must remember that this problem is systemic and not forget about the youth coming behind them. Some of them are the siblings and nieces and nephews of the children of those in prison and of the 100 deceased black men in Edgecombe County thus far this year. This is a whole generation of youth we know will be affected in one way or another. We must align and come together no matter our personal beliefs, religious beliefs, political beliefs, age, gender, etc., as a people to break this cycle. Listening and talking is not enough. We must act and be positioned to continue to act for generations to come. We didn't get to this place overnight, but we will not get out of it overnight. Myself and Freedom Organization will be active in this community and this county for generations to come and we hope to collaborate with others to see this work done in our communities. Um, I see this issue being addressed from three different perspectives from where I stand. Um, and so, and so uh, the municipality is one, and, and the municipality is tasked with carrying out the goals and vision of the people and what's best for the people. And grass, the grassroots uh, community organization, that perspective for me is organizing where, organizing where essentially we can fill the gaps uh, where government can't or not designed to fill in those gaps. And then personally, right? Me personally, from my scope, being a mental health practitioner, activist, and a proud Pennsylvania native, uh, these people are my family, be it by blood or relation. So this is why I'm here today, to talk to the municipality about some of the things that I suggest, being from here, talking to family, et cetera. And some of my family members can't be here today because it's GPO, so uh, we, know, <laughs> we know how that goes. Uh, but for the municipal, municipality, some of the things that I'm hearing from my community um, is things like establishing a police department, right? We can use ARPA funding that we have to establish this. As a part of the administration crime reduction agenda, President Joe Biden has voiced support for governments to strengthen their public safety efforts with the help of ARPA funding. In just one year, $10 billion in ARPA funding has already been allocated to support public safety agendas. By more than half, uh, by more than half of states and more than 300 communities across the country. 
In order to support and sustain a police department, we know we have to have money. So a way to do that is to really focus on increasing our tax base and so that we can provide services such as a police department for our citizens and support programming to build community relationships through our police department or, or supporting the Escombe County Sheriff's Department um, and, and building community relationships. And with some increased tax bases that we already have in place right now, is we already have ARPA funding allocated for repairing homes. And so we should really focus on the homes that are in the principal city uh, city limits, especially those families trying to get back to Matthew because we know the property value of those homes are going to be decreased at this point in time. If people are not applying, we can find ways to increase the application rate within the city limit. And I'll be more than willing to talk to my Commissioner, Ms. Linda Joyner, uh, about some ways that we can work together and that we can do that, right? Some of the things are, which I've already emailed you about, is some of the restrictions that we have on our current application process. Um, and really strategizing and coming together and figuring out how, as a community, we can build, right? Um, and so, as we're doing that, though, for me, it's already been talked about, we know statistically and factually that a recession is coming. Like, we know that. And we're proud of the development and development plans that we have in place, but I've been saying for like the last six, seven years um, that we should already be thinking proactively of how do we protect the citizens that are already here doing this development. So if property taxes are going to increase, we got to be able to support uh, our community members who have put in their blood, sacrifice, and tears uh, over the years through PTSD of flooding. Um, that is something that we don't talk about a lot. A lot of people are scared to come back because of that trauma. Um, you know, and things like that. So also with them, I've been talking about mental health. Um, I'm a younger practitioner. And so I'm seeing some of the, the current issues, right? Uh, and one of the biggest things that I see in my community is the stigmatization of mental wellness and mental illness. And so until we can get to a place where we can educate and we can, um, we can destigmatize mental health and, and not really pour all of our, uh, because yeah, the 2.9%, that's, that's a very small number. But that aren't, and just because they're not a part of that 2.9% of a serious illness, a lot of these other illnesses are, especially when they're much or lower undeveloped, any little thing can set a kid off, right? Um, and, and as Reverend Jordan is saying, we're not here to blame, we're here to support, we're here to stand in the gap, we're here, we're here to intercede um, and work together. Um, another way that I find that you all can. Five minutes left, please. Okay, can I get some of my time back from the interruption? I mean, I did, I did get an extra minute. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Pinto. How's everybody doing? How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Okay, uh, so I know I know a lot of my points have been uh, already pretty much at this point. Um, but I first want to introduce myself. I'm Henry Grantham, former at Brooklyn Organic Farm. I'm also the Agricultural Development Affairs Manager for the Common Education Organization. Um, and I have the answer to go, but I'm pretty much here uh, to explain it on the All right, so, real briefly, um, as we're constantly reminded about COVID, you know, and the pandemic and things like that, um, I now see that this has somewhat been a way to continuously distract us from an even bigger picture in our communities, which is the war on our black men. We are lacking the resources as well as having genuine guidance throughout all aspects of our lives. We need new innovative spaces for our programming. We need leaders who are directing the vision of our community. We need clean of food. Freedom Organization and Golden Organic Farm has constantly showed up for our community, town officials, and will continue to do so. As an organization that was formed, we ask for more support on multiple levels so we can be there for our community, so we can bridge these gaps that people are constantly attacking. Uh, we're talking about parenting, like, come on, man, like, really? Are we really putting so much blame on parenting, knowing that the parents don't even have the resources that they need? So, as a form of, it's just really frustrating, you know? It's just really frustrating because I come to all these meetings and deal with the same context and nobody's really doing it. You know, it's always about ego or what somebody has done 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. But we see our community now, you are still literally dying. And all we can talk about is what we did 50 years ago, but we see that that impact has not done what it was supposed to do. So instead of reinventing the wheel, why are we really just 
having more intimacy in the relationship building process. These kids don't trust the official. These kids don't trust the sheriff department. These kids don't trust a lot of these organizations, especially mentoring programming. Like a lot of parents come to me wanting me to mentor their kids. I'm not a mentor. Uh, a lot of these fathers and dads are not mentors. You know, we're leaders in a certain extent, and we're here to lead. We're not here to mentor anybody because of the contradictions that come with that. You know, the contradictions that come with just existing as a human. You know, so we're constantly trying to point fingers, but do we not see how many fingers are pointing back at us? So why are we not doing what we can do to a higher extent to really bridge the gap? Because it's more so a communication than it is anything. You know, so nobody's really taking the time to really sit these kids down and have a conversation with them. They're telling them what's wrong. They're putting all these medications on them, putting them in prisons and in more more walls. You know what I'm saying? Like they need to be free. You know, they need to be on farms. They need to be in gardens where it's actually killing properties that's naturally designed that help rebuild them. You know, as far as you know, growing fresh produce. You know, we talk a lot about food, like. We have, to, we have to cleanse our pineal glands. There's so many spiritual aspects that's connected to our community that we're leaving out. So that's why our communities are not as whole as they used to be. Because we are using government funding, and that's just, they just using that dangling over our head. He encourages us to create more 501c3s, but how much more competition is that putting in our communities? You know, we're already struggling with funding, but why are we still going against each other, you know what I'm saying? And the municipalities on on another end is like, we reaching out to y'all for help and guidance, and y'all just, it's just real frustrating. Now, I speak for you because I'm 29 years old, you know, so when we really striving to be something in our lives, and we have, and we just have so many gaps of communications of where we can go and resources. What, what resource center is there besides like community how it's just heavily government? You know what I'm saying? Like, we need grassroots organizations with power where they are the ones that's bridging the gaps in our community. Like, we don't need government officials coming in our community telling us we need government officials having relationships with our community leaders. And our community leaders are bridging the gap because those are the ones that's more in our community to put on the ground and actually trying to do something. So, sorry, I said a lot. I'm just very concerned about, you know, really just slandering around our youth. These kids might not even really be in the positions that they are in if they have other choices. So empower them and give them the choices, give them the opportunities to make better decisions. You know, they don't even have a lot of opportunities. We gotta go all the way to Raleigh for a decent meal. Or uh, uh, actual wholesome meal. They gotta go to Raleigh. Good call, man. Good call. Good call. Like, you no, know, man, especially people that's looking for healthier options. So we just have to be better and we have to meet our kids where they are. You know, we have a summer camp where we bring our kids to the farm and we talk to them and we, you know, teach them how to cook, how to stretch, how to breathe, you know, how builders come out and things like that. But we know our kids in our area want to be, you know, professional athletes and things like that. But statistics show that not all of them are going to be professional. So what are we designing for them to fall back on? You know, so we are implying agriculture curriculum to help boost that gap. You know, it's under 2% black farmers in America. You know, but we want to push our kids to do all this other stuff. Like, let's push them to grow, uh, grow some food, cook some food, prepare food, you know, or just teach about it. You know, so, so much going on, but we're going to take our time and, you know, we just want to keep doing it. We just ask that everyone be open to, to new innovative ideas because our kids are our future. You know, we, we're still listening to Politicians that's been in place for 10, 20 years. But why are our kids still in the same position? So we need new, innovative leaders, and we and they need genuine support. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Question. Thank you. Um, I, I got a question. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Are we? I mean, Olivia Dorn.
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm glad y'all brought this meeting together. Yeah, it took a long time for this meeting to happen. We may have a thousand respect here for longer than years ago. We try to get a meeting to come to you, but one by list. It took two killings to have a meeting like this. I'm glad y'all got to go. My first man, I want to talk to speak at a couple people that spoke tonight. This broke on me. You know, Kofi, he can tell you, I love Keith. I love working with Keith. I try to use the impact that I went through living in apartment 48 Asbury Park. 313 months died. When I was dealing with all this shit. When I was dealing with getting in trouble. When I was dealing with getting something, I'm God for it. Given a choice, either go to jail or go to God. So, that's why I try to tell the kids today, don't do what I did growing up at the age of 12, 13 years old. Because they had to make you go to school to get your education. Mr. Shaw, the Tommy Academy program, I was a mentor down there. I loved it. I saw a lot of kids to that program. It was a long ride, no few kids, but I enjoy working with kids at Fabio Academy. It's a good program, a very good program. So we need to start with something over here in Crestville that with the young people. Right now, there's 16 on up. We got to fight to pull them back in. So the law, the ones below 16, I think we can work with them. And we got to get some programs started. We ain't gonna sit here and say, oh yeah, we have a meeting. This is the third meeting. So come Monday, Monday morning, um, somebody needs to be on the phone, make a phone call. Somebody needs to be looking for grant money. Get some programs started. Well, we helped out a lot now I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. We need to get our own law enforcement in Princeville. We should have to pay his own county to protect <coughs> them when they get ready. What room is going there? He gone? I want to know who brought him out, take the sheriff's department. Them. Well, I can see a lot of our deputy involved in the city living in Rocky Mountain. But we have to pay them to come over here and protect us and pick what time they're going to they gonna do it. Folks over here may pay tax in Crestville, tax across the bridge, but it's going to count the sheriff's department getting two checks mm-hmm. from the citizens of Crestville to protect them. It's not fair. That's why I live on, I live on East Rock. But my heart is in Christmas. I'm going to be beat up for life. Got a man right there on the stay on. Anytime I call that man, somebody got a problem. He show up. He show up. I don't care what neighborhood it is. He don't mind talking to you. Sometimes we'll be on the phone for two or three hours. Now he got a girlfriend. He, he already got the phone with him. <laughs> 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 we got to start now. A three meeting, we shouldn't wait for a fourth meeting to say, hey, we got this done. Out of three meetings, y'all should have something in order to start working on. We need young people. You know, I'm going to phone call away.
Tem pessoas que não falam. Diz que é Deus, pode ver com o alhão aqui. Que toca. Que você fala a verdade. Isso aí. Isso aí. Thank you. 
in the scrabble. So I would go to the ED, and the ED physician would give me vitamins. When all the vitamins were gone, I would go right back to the ED. So after my third visit to the ED, the physician told me, he said, Joe, I'm not giving you any more vitamins. He said, because what I'm doing is I'm soothing the symptoms, but I'm not dealing with the root cause of the problem. Come on now. So you need to go see a dentist. A dentist can get to the root cause of what's going on. And I shared with the mayor, in this meeting, we don't want to do anything that's just going to take care of the symptoms. Hmm. But we must get to the root cause of the problem. And in reaching the root cause of the problem, uh, maybe we can stop the recidivism, hmm. the, the, the returning to the jail, the, the, the killing of, of, of each other. Um, so what I've been doing the past few days is uh, researching. I've been looking for evidence-based solutions, not this impulsive stuff, but evidence-based solutions. And we're going to try to figure out how can we tailor this to fit the needs of Princeville. Again, we thank you all for sharing, and we thank all of you for coming. And I, too, would like to thank all of you for coming, because it says to me, no matter what you say, I know how to do it that thank you. It says to me that we definitely just have an interest in the health of Princeville. And not only Princeville, Pine Tops, Canada, Carlborough, and the surrounding areas. And we're having this meeting because in every area there is a challenge. And I listened to every presenter here this evening, I listened to every uh, person that came up to, to, to share their concern. There's a plumb line. There is a plumb line, and, and everybody's pretty much saying the same thing. We're speaking the same language. We may say it different, but every challenge that we are facing, we know what it is. And I echo what you said about finding the root cause. And Dr. Dr. Shaw hit on some of the things about the generational thing. There are some things that's going to take some deep digging and some hard kicking to fix it. We may not fix those that are directly involved right now, but we need to cut some things off at the core before our young people, those younger ones, run up on it. So when the younger ones are get to the point where some of the, I know the ages are changing. I went in to ask the sheriff, the, the uh, a lieutenant before he left, when is it that they noticed the, the increase? in the gang banging and the increase in the criminal activities in the community. When is it that that was noticed? What's the timeline? So what we need to be doing is listening together. Not one person in here has the answer. The, the answer. Understand what I'm saying? But I promise you if we pull together, if we lay the weapons down, if we come to come together and reason, if we can talk and not point, not fight, not accuse, not criticize, if we can do that, then we are moving in the right direction. We're at least moving in the right direction. Reverend Jordan says we're going to keep things about community, building, capacity. You know the board cannot do it all, and I understand that. We all understand that. But I promise you, if we do it together, there is a place for community to step in because it's just not our community, it's all of us. I can't be just concerned about 501 Mother Street. That's where I live. Because if 501 Mother Street is, is, is the only place that's healthy for me, it's really not healthy. I'm just looking at one thing. We have got to come together as a people. That historically, we've had a hard time doing, guys. Historically, we've been known to point fingers and to blame. Historically, we've not known how to work together because we've been so departmentalized. I have a passion for this. 
I'm just not sending you. I was headed back to Greensboro when I was railroaded to come and run the commission. I said, well, since I'm here, since I had to change a plan, since I had to change a mindset, since I had complained about some things that I thought was not happening, since I campaigned on God bless a child that has his own prick and needs his own police department, and we do, but there are some prerequisites to that. Hmm. There are some things that has to happen. My parents all the time told me, don't live beyond your means. <coughs> don't go out there and live. I want to buy a brand new car when I got my first job. And then my dad was not one that could read. He was not one that could write. We taught our dad how to sign his name. Because when I first remember, dad was putting out X's. But dad told me, he said, tell, how, tell me how much you make a, a week. I get paid weekly, you know, your friend. <laughs> Add that up, Linda. You want to go buy a brand new car. Tell me what the payment on a brand new car. I told him what it was. You the girl, you can't afford the gas in the car. You talking about a new car? We don't want to be so, it is time past. For a police department. But when we look at our budget, that's what we have to go on. When we get our citizen base up, that's what we're working on. There is a process to this. I campaigned on God bless a child that has his own Princeville Needle Police Department, and we do. I'll say that every day. But it's no need to get one for one year, and you can't afford them. Another year. Hmm. When we get to the place where we can build our community back bigger, better, and bolder, then guys, let's look at our police department. We will need it then. But why don't we have the now yes, Edgecombe County Sheriff Department does, we do pay them. If we did not, we all have one sheriff, one sheriff who will be covering Princeville, Canada, Speed, Leggett. Uh, pine Top, well not Pine Top, but you have your sheriff department, your police department. But you have one sheriff who will cover all of those departments. At least we do have sheriffs in the community. And we do have sheriffs in the community who patrol at a certain time. That's what we can afford. We ain't trying to scam off the top. We're trying to be less than. We're trying to be good stewards over what we have. We're trying to, to have some protection. Rocky now have a whole fleet of police officers and being tired. Hmm. Right. They may get there after the fact. These kids don't are not afraid of living. They're not afraid of dying. That's what we need to work on. These kids can care less about a police officer, a uniform, a gun. They probably got bigger guns than the police. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what we gotta work on, that mindset. We're not here because we know so much. Let's be, yes, we listen. And I declare if we do it together, I believe we'll get some results. If we stop blaming and stop pointing fingers and stop saying what well, who ain't doing what. If, if the truth be told, we base this on what, what happened last week, and none of us going to that. <laughs> <laughs> my cry and my plea to you. Can we do it together? Can we come together as a you, Hey, guys, you know who we are as a people. We are resilient. We put our resiliency together. I promise you we'll come out with a product, a product that's meet for success. But we gotta do it together. We gotta learn how to forgive and forget. And that's something that's rather easy for me. I can forget, my, my sister can tell you, when we were young, there were 10 of us in the household, and my brother used to get to fight, and we've been fighting, and mama said, what do you fight about? No. I can forget just that quick. Guys, we can do this. We can do this. 
I promise you we can. But there is a process. And I am committed. My brother, I am committed. I am committed. I promise you it won't happen overnight, but guess what? It will happen if we stand one. There you go. If we stand as one, it will happen. God bless you and thank you all so much for coming out to say, I'm here. Jesus called that we were out of the Let me just say, moving forward, step moving forward, we're going to have another meeting the last Sunday of next month. And I'll get with the board members and see if that's going to pay for to use this building. But I'm committed as well. You think they're going to talk to tell me we can't use this building? We're going to be someplace. Next month, the last Sunday of the month, at 5 o'clock. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about each municipality coming together as a subcommittee, subcommittee to include two parents, two students, one elected official, one mental health professional, one law enforcement professional, one educator, and one clergy. All of them working together to meet at a different time to come up with strategies and solutions and to look for particular grants, especially crime prevention grants, and bring that to the full meeting on next month. Does that sound feasible? Hightower, Harbor, and I'm going to call the other mayors tomorrow to see if they will work with us. This is the only way we can get it done. This is a cancer that's spread all over the United States of America and all over the world. It doesn't have to be here. We can make a difference if we work together. Let me close out Mayor Perkins and then we're going to come to you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Then probably move the second that we adjourn all the questions. All the things you need to go sign high. Go to the table. Ah, Tabitha, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am.
Thank you so much. Let me say this one quick announcement. We, 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 uh, Dr. Knight and, and Ms. Kelsey and I went to a general assembly meeting in September. If there are any of you here that have, have been uh, dealing with NC Rebuild, please give us your name so that we can we have some additional information to you. Um, and if you're one of them, anyone else that is involved in Princeville with NC Rebuild, Please give us your name and phone number so we can get in contact with you so we can give you some updated information. Okay, the meeting is over with you. Let me share something right quick. Not the council, y'all can go about your business. Let me share something with everybody in the church. Um, Ms. Bishop, Mr. Bishop, okay. Mr. Bishop, okay. Mr. Bishop, and, and I want to speak to y'all right quick, but don't, don't go in there because I want to share something. And, 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 and really, that, I got to say it because it's on my heart. Everybody's talking about having a meeting. You're upset about having meetings. Y'all heard my stories. Have your own meeting. Start your own thing to help your community. You don't have to wait once a month. Freedom of organization. Y'all can act, just ask them to use the museum you over there. Have your own meetings. Okay, if they won't let you, find a spot that will let you. No, 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 listen, listen, me and you ain't got to go back and forth. I'm just giving you a solution. Have it where you can have it. Have it where you can have it. Start where you can start. Because this here, all those things that me and a small group of people accomplished, we didn't wait for the local elected officials. No, it ain't, ain't, it ain't, it ain't personal. It ain't personal. I'm just, I'm just making point because I didn't hear a lot. A lot of stuff out echoing was talking about twenty minutes. The people in this community. No, what I'm, what I'm saying, what, what I'm saying is, what I'm, no, the difference is, I was trying to get a solution. So y'all have y'all meetings to come up with all the solutions and move out from them. It don't have to. You know, you know, I've been there, done that. I've been there, done that. We're talking about right now. All right. Okay. Let's do this. Let's do this. I want to hear what y'all Because we got five minutes to talk. Right. I got you. Let me hear what you're talking about. Let's do this. I'm not talking to you because you.